Tonight, we're going, we'll hear from an elected official, a labor attorney, and a fellow union public employee about House Bill 1199, the COVID-19 Presumptive Language Bill. Our webinar will be structured in a way that allows us to listen and learn more about this particular bill and the protections it will ensure us as public employees. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a tab for questions and answers. We ask that you use that to ask and submit questions. Our team members at AFT Maryland will receive those questions and make sure you get your questions answered by our labor attorney. The presentation from the speakers will be recorded. However, the questions and answer portion will not. This is our effort to make sure our workers feel comfortable asking questions. We hope you leave this webinar with a greater understanding of what protection this legislation will provide for the workplace. This presumptive language says it's the employer's responsibility to show or prove that if you contract COVID-19, you do not become infected at the workplace or you did not become infected at the workplace. Let me repeat that again. This presumptive language says, it's the employer's responsibility to show or prove that if you contract COVID-19, you did not become infected at the work site. This evening, we'll hear about what the legislation does specifically, why this bill is so important for public employees and their families, and what rights you are entitled to legally. First, we'll hear from Delegate Chris Valderrama from District 26. She is the sponsor of this bill. We will also hear from Kimberly Reed. Ms. Reed is an ASME member and has an important story to share about how COVID affects public employees and the families they go home to. Lastly, we'll hear from Mr. Dan Udall, a labor attorney from Con Smith and Collins. He leads his firm's workman's compensation work. But most importantly, we want to hear from you. Use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen not only for questions you may have, but comments or your own personal story. If there is something that we'll need to follow up on, please let us know your local union so that someone from your local can follow up. Now let's hear from our first speaker, Delegate Chris Dandarama. Good evening and thank you President English and AFT members and everyone who's here this evening uh, for this important town hall. Uh, for, for the record, uh, my name is Chris Valderrama representing Legislative District 26 in the great state, uh, great county, uh, Prince George's County. Let me start by saying that. Uh, also, I wanna preface by saying that while I am introducing this legislation, I want to make clear to everyone uh, on this town hall that workers' compensation bills are very um, intricate, uh, and by no means do I claim to be the expert. I think the most expert person here might be our labor attorney, Mr. Daniel Udoff. Uh, while I chair the subcommittee of workers' compensation on the House Economic Matters Committee, and I serve as House Joint Chair along with Senator Kathy Klausmeyer for the Workers' Compensation and Insurance Oversight Committee, uh, we are citizen legislators and we are honored to uh, serve in this position and we take our responsibilities due diligently and try our best, do our best to understand the intricate world of workers' compensation. Uh, so having said that, uh, before I had introduced this legislation, I had conversations with folks from AFT who approached me about this legislation and I'm very transparent uh, when it comes to uh, putting in legislation, especially my name on legislation. So I want everyone here to know that I understand why this legislation uh, was requested and why we can see that it's needed. And in this time of COVID, 
um, it was my honor to introduce it, uh, but by no means uh, I will do my best and that's all I can do. And I don't do anything half, um, I don't do anything half, there's a word that I wanna use, but I will not use it uh, on this platform, but I give it my 110%. And so having said that, I, I don't like to give false promises or make uh, promises that cannot be kept, but my promise to everyone here is to work this bill the best that I can and to see how we can do uh, work with our folks across the aisle and, and making sure that folks know that this is a needed piece of legislation. So with that said, uh, good evening again. And for those who may not know, the workers' compensation system here uh, in our great state of Maryland, as it is currently set up, makes it really hard to get workers' compensation for COVID, especially presumptive language that I am introducing uh, this year. In general, uh, airborne infections like colds and seasonal flu are excluded from workers' compensation coverage in all states. Uh, the thinking goes that since there is widespread transmission in both the community and in workplaces, it is impossible to determine where the employee was exposed and thus unreasonable to hold the employer responsible for con contracting the illness. So Maryland law is particularly stringent in assigning employer responsibility. And so, in, for example, in a 2019 case where Baltimore County versus Quinlan, Quinlan the Maryland Court of Appeals set out a three-part test for workers' compensation coverage, uh, where an employee must show, one, that the risk of the illness is inherent in your job, two, that the risk is greater in your job than it is in general employment, and last, that your job actually exposed you to that risk. So as you can see, this is not an easy test to meet. So employees in a few occupations that involve direct contact with COVID-19 patients, like first responders and some healthcare workers, will have an easier time making their cause, case, I should say, but most other workers will have a difficult time. So it is unclear how judges in Maryland will apply the law uh, when it comes to other jobs that may pose a high risk of infection. For example, teachers, bus drivers, or prison guards, for another example. Because COVID-19 is not just any airborne disease, several states have changed their law to make it easier for exposed employees to get workers' compensation. Whether by state law or by executive order, diverse states like California, Kentucky, New Jersey, and Minnesota now presume the virus was obtained during the course of employment. The bill that I'm introducing this year, House Bill 1199, will add Maryland to that growing list of states, presuming workplace exposure was the source of COVID-19 for certain employees, unless an employer can prove otherwise. Thus, the burden of proving non-exposure is to the employer. This legislation has a wide coverage for so-called uh, quote-unquote frontline workers. So uh, I ask that you bear with me as I list all the workers covered by this uh, proposed law. I think the workers, uh, it's important to understand just how vast the scope of worker coverage is under this bill, which also is uh, the vast coverage also makes it very difficult to move a piece of legislation like this. So when I emphasize this, I am not, I don't wanna de-emphasize, I want to emphasize so that everyone here understands the difficulty in moving such a piece of legislation. So the scope of worker coverage under this bill, it covers all paid and volunteer firefighters, rescue squads, advanced life support units and paramedics, paid police officers, whether employed by an airport authority, a transit authority, a county, a municipality or the state are covered, Sheriffs, deputy sheriffs are covered as our COs or security counselors employed at corrections, detention, or secure treatment facilities. The legislation covers education workers who work in schools and institutions of higher learning, including teachers, paraeducators, support workers, administrative personnel, maintenance, and food service workers. Essential workers, those identified as required to work on the premises of a business or government agency by a state of emergency declaration issued by a local, state, or federal authority are also covered. 
child care workers who are required to provide care for the children of first responders and health care workers are also covered. And of course, health care workers who work at a licensed facility that provides health care, home care, or long term care, whose duties include direct patient care. Ancillary workers in these facilities who work in areas where patients are diagnosed and treated are also covered. So, as I said earlier, it will be presumed that an employee who works in one of these settings and who contracts COVID-19 has contracted the virus in the workplace and is therefore covered by Maryland workers' compensation laws. An employer can rebut this presumption, but must show that employment was not a contribute, contributing factor. There are certain other requirements for making out one's claim. One, you must, uh, you must suffer the effects of COVID-19. Two, you must be diagnosed by testing positive for the virus or coronavirus antibodies. Three, you must have worked at a site other than your residence within 14 days before symptom onset. Four, you must provide a copy of your test results or diagnosis to your employer and or insurer. So with everything I have just explained, obviously this is a huge bill, big bill, huge bill, however you wanna describe it. And by that, I mean, it will affect many workers. And because of that, the fiscal note on this, I don't have, but it will be expensive. So that in and of itself always is a deterrent in moving any kind of legislation. But we all know that uh, you know, an illness, a death, one is too many and cost should not be a factor. But as we all know, in reality, it is mm -hmm. when it comes to moving said legislation and especially as I emphasize repeatedly presumptive language. So every bill in Annapolis is required to have a fiscal note before it is heard by the committee, which by the way, if I have not mentioned, this bill hearing is scheduled for March 2nd um, in Economic Matters Committee. Uh, I don't need a fiscal note to tell me that this will have a significant impact on all levels of government, on private employers, including hospitals and healthcare providers. So it is here that I am asking all of you here on this in this town hall that there needs to be serious discussion in talking about a strategy on how to get this bill passed. I'm one person, right? So I can advocate and advocate, but I cannot do it alone. And so, because I guarantee you, it will not pass without your help, without anyone's help. Advocacy is of the utmost importance when it comes to this type of bill. Uh, the other side has already started working against the bill um, as soon as they heard of it, before I could even introduce it. You know, nothing, nothing is a secret here in Annapolis. Everything, and, and it shouldn't be, right? It should be very transparent. So. I know that because insurers and employer organizations have already made appointments with me uh, virtually uh, to meet about this bill. So governments, hospitals, and private employers, large and small, are powerful groups here in Annapolis uh, who will only be defeated if members of the assembly hear from you, their constituents. You, are, you must make your voice heard regarding this issue. It, you know. It, I, I can't emphasize it enough. So if I'm repetitive, I apologize, but I am just trying to stress how much work needs to be done. Moreover, uh, the General Assembly, as you may imagine, uh, is being bombarded in all manners of COVID-19 legislation. Uh, and I don't think that's a surprise to anyone here, uh, totally bombarded with all manners of legislation that seeks worker protections or employer protections or money for vaccines money to help small business stay in business or money for PPE or financial assistance for the unemployed and all legitimate, obviously. So the list of bills is lengthy as befits the seriousness of this virus and the hardship that it has inflicted on all Marylanders. So again, we need a strategy to get this bill and the benefits it offers noticed, understood and accepted. So, uh, I urge you to start tonight, if you haven't already, uh, develop a one or two page summary of the bill, 
point out that other states have enacted similar measures, make your case. That's all I ask. Uh, reach out to your own delegate and senator. Let them know why this bill is important to you and how it will help you. Tell your personal story. Um, I will, it probably goes without saying, but I will say it nonetheless because I have seen it firsthand um, and I'm not shocked. Uh, I know the, the impassioned advocates on all types of COVID-19 legislation. I have seen it, I have witnessed it, and you know everyone's emotions are rising quite high during this time. So when I say to reach out to your legislators, please don't ever threaten or insult or get so angry at a legislator because that is never effective. And I can tell you, you know, this bill's gone. You know, if if, if we can all just reach out and and tell our story, uh, and I and I understand there are personal stories that will be following uh, my testimony this evening. Um, just know that everyone here understands everyone is in a crisis. So having said that, uh, I always try myself personally to stay open-minded, but it is very difficult to do that when you're being attacked. So when you tell your story, just you know, be as passionate as possible without being negative. Uh, legislators are human too, despite what some people may think. Um, also try, and I think this is also important, uh, if there is an advocacy group within this group here or outside of this group, I don't recommend form letters, okay? So when it's a standard letter and everyone just signs their name on it, those are not effective. The only thing you will get out of that is that it will get the legislators' attention saying, no, this is an important issue. But uh, a lot of representatives, including myself, uh, we want to know why it is important and how it will improve your life, right? So believe it or not, um, that's why most of us are here in Annapolis, or at least that's why I'm here, uh, to make our constituents live easier and our state a better place to live. So as a member of the House Economic Matters Committee, and as I mentioned earlier, as the chair of the Workers' Compensation Subcommittee, I know I will hear from parties from all over Maryland who are both for and against. And so with that, I just urge all of you here to just make sure your personal voice is heard in getting this measure passed. And uh, it was, um, so with that, I will just end and say that again, presumptive language bills, but especially in the, era, in the area of workers' compensation really is a big feat uh, to get over. And with your help, we can do our best to get it done. Um, it was said that there will be q and A. I was asked to present. I think most of the questions will be geared towards the labor attorney and those who have experienced personal stories. So um, if there are questions for me, please feel free to contact my office or if AFT has a direct link or um, I'm not sure what the format is. Uh, I will not be on here for the q and A part, but I just wanted to extend um, my support and if you need to contact the office, we are here. And especially with this issue, please let us know uh, how we can assist or if we can assist, whatever the case may be. But with that said, uh, it is my honor to have uh, been one of the presenters here this evening for this town hall. And I hope everyone stays safe and God bless. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kenya Campbell, Secretary Treasurer for AFT Maryland. And I want to start out by saying to Delegate Valderrama that we appreciate you for taking the time out of your schedule to be here tonight. We know that during this time of the year, you're super busy with legislative matters. But thank you for sponsoring and realizing the importance of this legislation on the lives of our members. We will be with you on March 2nd, telling our stories in an effort to get House Bill 1199 passed. That's our goal. Next, I would like to introduce our next panelist, Kimberly Reed, a field rep and member of ASME 2250. This evening, Ms. Reed is going to share her story with you and the obstacles that were placed on her family as a result of a family member contracting COVID while on the job. Please take it away, Ms. Reed. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Kimberly Reed and I am a field rep um, with ACE Ask Me Local 2250, um, a former bus driver for Prince George's County Public Schools. 
I'm here to tell you that my family's story and my family's story revolves around my sister, my sister, Teresa Lehman, um, known to many as Terry. Um, she lives with myself, our children and our mother. Um, back in mid-May, Governor Hogan mandated that persons and guests entering nursing facilities be screened for temperatures and given a questionnaire about traveling outside of the state or if you've been in contact with anybody with COVID. At this time, my sister was handed a surgical mask and told, make it last a week or wear it until it breaks. According to the nursing facility administrative staff, they were not allowed to wear homemade masks nor wear masks from the outside. The mask they were given was only to be worn inside the building. And when they were leaving for the day, they had to leave it at their workstation and place it in a brown paper bag. Yes, you heard that right. A brown lunch bag left at your work site with your mask in it that you have worn all week. Um, more and more residents and staff started becoming sick and were transported to the hospital, having to pass through the reception area where my sister was a receptionist at a skilled nursing facility. A few of the guests came in and out through the reception area and my sister was the person who was screening these people, taking their temperatures and asking the questions. Because of the short staff, because of so many nurses in the facility becoming sick, my sister was the one who was designated to screen people. Nurses did not have enough PPE and were wearing hospital gowns over top of their uniforms as a way to try to protect themselves. On March, I'm sorry, on April 28th, my sister tested positive after her daughter who also worked at this skilled nursing facility as an activities person and filled in in the reception area became sick. She was put in observation for a few hours at Kaiser and was sent home. She was instructed to contact her doctor if her oxygen levels had dropped below 90%. She was given a doctor's note for two weeks to stay home in quarantine. On April 29th, the next day, her oxygen levels were 85. So she called her doctor who instructed her to call 911. She was transported to the hospital and on April 30th, she was placed on a ventilator. By this time, the whole house had become exposed to my sister who had tested positive for COVID-19. Our mother, all of the children, and even the dog. Our mother had underlying health concerns as she was a diabetic. So we took extra precautions once we learned my sister had tested positive to isolate our mom to try to protect her. On May 6th, myself and my mother were hospitalized. I didn't even know my mom was sick. We did all the right things or so we thought the right things to protect her. She never complained of any symptoms, just that she tried to be that she was tired of being cooped up in her room. I had to tell her several times, mom, it's not easy, but we'll make it work. She'd post on Facebook day in and day out about how she's scared and how she didn't wanna have the virus. But on May 6th, she was placed, she went to the emergency room because she was having trouble breathing. I too was rushed to the hospital as I had trouble breathing. Um, When she was admitted to the hospital on May 6th, my mother asked if she would be allowed to see her daughter, which is my sister, who was already in ICU on a ventilator. When they admitted my mom to the hospital, they made a special trip to the ICU on, their, on her way to her room. 
My mom told my sister, it'll be okay, just fight, and she would be okay. Not knowing that on May 8th, my mom would also be placed on a ventilator, less than 24 hours after being admitted. So by May 8th, my sister and my mother are both on ventilators. I was already hospitalized after feeling like death. I know it sounds horrible, but honestly, that's what COVID feels like. I was lucky and didn't need a ventilator, but my sister and mother weren't so lucky. While on the ventilator, my sister's doctor's note that she had been given had expired on May 11th. Her company was very aware that she was on a ventilator and unable to return to work. Our mother passed away on May 18th, just 10 days after being placed on a ventilator. Our dog, who we assume had COVID as well, passed away on May 19th. My sister was still on the ventilator until May 25th, but not fully awake until May 27th. She had another few weeks of recovering to do before she could move to a rehab facility. The hospital staff told her she was the only person to make it off a ventilator alive. Once she was well enough to be transferred to a rehab facility and hopefully get stronger, she applied for workers' compensation, but was denied because there is no language that supports COVID as a diagnosis for work workers' comp. But my sister's doctor assured her that even with, and even the company handling her claim that she contracted COVID from her workplace. And along with only being allowed to have one mask and had to wear it until it broke. My sister has been in and out of the hospital since the end of July with several complications from COVID. Her lungs are damaged and she may never be able to have her tracheotomy removed because doctors are in fear that she'll go back into respiratory failure. When she applied for workers' comp and was denied, this is when she learned that her employer had terminated her, saying that she re, um, refused to come back to work after her doctor's note had expired. But let me remind you, she was on a ventilator near death fighting for her life on May 12th when she was terminated. Imagine going to sleep on April 3rd, April 30th, and waking up to Freddie Gray all over the news, and then being told your mom passed away from COVID on May 18th, that your sister was hospitalized as well. She was not even completely aware of what was going on. So her, herself, she herself trying to fight for her life and hearing that your mom is gone, then learning your job terminated you. Going through this pandemic is hard enough, but just imagine what it's like almost dying, being on a ventilator for a month and then being denied workers comp when you know you contracted COVID from your workplace. I urge you to support House Bill 1199. This bill not only supports my sister and our family, but so many other frontline essential personnel that have been working tirelessly through this pandemic. Ms. Reed, thank you so much for being here to share such a heartfelt story. Your story is one of many that we have either heard of or yet to hear. That's why it is so important for us to be aware of our rights while at the workplace and understanding what options are at our disposal if something like this happens. Our thoughts and prayers go out to you, Kimberly, and your family. I want to remind participants on our virtual town hall tonight to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to input any questions that you may have for tonight. Now we will move to our next panelist who will provide us with an understanding of workers' compensation and Maryland presumptive language on COVID-19. Mr. Daniel Udoff is an attorney with Con Smith and Collins. He oversees the firm's workers' compensation cases. He also has extensive experience with presumptive language cases. Mr. Udoff is here tonight to share some insight on what all members need to know as it relates to Maryland presumptive language and COVID-19. With that said, I will hand the mic over virtually to Mr. Daniel Udoff. 
Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I hope that uh, everyone is doing as well as possible under the circumstances. For the record, again, my name is Dan Udoff. I'm the uh, lead workers' comp attorney over at uh, the law firm of Kahn, Smith & Collins. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to provide some more uh, information um, as well as a practical sense um, of, of where this is headed and the benefits of the presumptive language that, that have been discussed. Um, firstly, I would like to express my thanks to AFT for allowing me to help participate in the process of getting this bill together and also for allowing me the privilege to be part of this town hall uh, as well as help their members uh, in every, res uh, every respect uh, possible. It's, it's truly an exceptional organization. Um, uh, the, the leadership is fantastic. They're a pleasure to work with. And I know um, from experience that, that they will do everything possible for their members. I'd also like to thank the delegate um, for sponsoring this bill, which I personally and professionally believe is vital and well overdue. Um, I think the bill as, is, as it was submitted in its final form is fantastic. Um, it's very, very thorough. It's got all the essential language. It covers just about everyone um, that, that uh, we could think of uh, in, in helping to draft it. And uh, candidly, uh, we really could use more delegates, more delegates like her. Um, I'd also like to express my sympathies to the Reed family for everything that they've gone through. I certainly and sincerely hope that things take a turn for the better. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the experiences that were shared uh, are, are not uncommon. And it's a, it's a function of a system which has really failed uh, in most respects when it comes to this topic. And is an obvious need of um, some, some major overhauls. So with respect to the bill itself, I know that there are a lot of questions um, and I wanted to break down the presentation as, um, you know, I wanna simplify it into, into three basic topics. Number one, why is this bill important? Number two, what is the legal significance of the language that's being um, proposed? And three, if the bill does pass, hopefully it will, what do you still need to do as a worker to make sure that you are protected and given all the benefits of the law and all the benefits that this bill is supposed to provide? So jumping into the first question, um, why is this bill so important and necessary? Well, as you've heard, um, the workers' compensation system at this point in time, when it comes to COVID specifically, um, is not supportive in any respect. Uh, I'm not gonna sit here quoting statistics, although I follow them. Uh, that's because they're constantly changing, but I can safely report and unfortunately report that on a nationwide level, as well as on a local level, these cases are not succeeding in the courtrooms. They are being challenged left and right by employers, uh, the charges being led by the insurance companies, and way too often, way too often, they're winning. So I, I wanna stop there. I don't wanna suggest that it's not possible to win the case, but they can be exceedingly difficult to prove. Everything is fact specific to an individual situation, what kind of documentation there is, as well as what kind of medical evidence um, the person has in support of their claim. So one of my concerns early on with this, which is uh, proven to be true, unfortunately, is that the very nature of this virus is what makes it so difficult to prove where it came from. The fact that it is as transmissible as it is in every walk of life, the fact that so many people can um, be infected by this and be asymptomatic and not even know that they're spreading it can make it a daunting task to have to walk into a courtroom and prove anything, let alone specific, uh, specifics in terms of where it was contracted and when. So unfortunately, this has translated into the reality that we're facing, which is a very, very poor success rate for these claims up to date. 
So that begs the question, how do we fix this? How do we address this? Well, um, by doing exactly what's being done, which is to which is to essentially change the law and make it less insurance and employer friendly and more supportive of, of the people that are out there uh, catching this disease as a result of the workplace. So that leads into the next subtopic that I um, outlined, which is what is the legal significance um, and potential effects of the language which is being proposed? And um, I don't wanna be redundant. The, um, the good delegate laid, laid this out very, very clearly and, and succinctly, and I agree with, with everything that she said. Um, simply put, this language is, is a very, very powerful piece of legislation. It creates a concept in the law, we've, we've heard the term this evening, called a presumption. What exactly is a presumption? Well, let's define it. Presumption is an idea which is taken to be true, although not known to be certain. Think about that in the legal context and think about what a powerful tool that is. In what other situations, as a moving party in a legal case, can you have the benefit of being presumed to be correct with what you're asserting before you even file a claim or step foot in a courtroom? It is, it is rare, it is significant, and again, it is, it is an incredibly powerful tool um, if put into effect. So as the delegate said, um, the purpose is to actually shift the burden of proof in the case. Um, as it stands now, proving an occupational disease um, involves, again, the employee showing that the essential elements of the job that are inherent to the job were really the culprits or at least contributing factors to the ailment in question. The typical case for that would be uh, a secretary or office worker that um, that has typed for a living for, for 20 hours a week, uh, 20 years, and develops carpal tunnel syndrome. That's your classic case of an occupational disease, which is born out of inherent work functions. The problem is that fact patterns are never that obvious. And most diseases or afflictions that people suffer from at work can oftentimes be suffered from in their personal lives. And that's what workers' comp commissioners, that's what juries uh, need to consider when determining causation in these types of cases. It's, think of it as, as a scale. On one side of the scale is, is the person's job and um, what that job entails and the effects the job has on the person. On the other side of the scale, though, are unrelated things. Things may be in the person's personal life. Um, which could have led to the affliction. And those things have got to be weighed by the trier of fact to determine what is most likely and what, again, is the cause of the problem. So the, the most important thing about this legislation is, again, it shifts the burden away from the employee having to prove that something positively or probably happened and it places the burden on the employer to disprove um, those, those assertions. Again, legal presumptions hold a great deal of weight and they can often make a claim successful where it otherwise maybe wouldn't have been successful. But this is a very important point that I wanna make here, which is, I cannot overstate the importance of this bill, but I also don't want to understate what you as a worker need to do to make sure that you are still in the best position possible to get what you've got coming your way if you are um, an unfortunate victim of this pandemic. And that brings me to the third topic, which is if this bill passes, what can you, in what can you expect from the other side and what can you best do to ensure your rights? So um, as again, um, already been mentioned, presumptions are rebuttable. And, and I wanna repeat that, presumptions 
are rebuttable. I've been doing this for a lot of years, working with workers' comp, working with presumptive language, and I can, I can promise everyone that's listening to this that nothing that an insurance company will do to save money will ever surprise me. There was a time where maybe I was a little shocked at these things, not anymore. They will stop at nothing to save themselves the costs of, of getting involved with these cases. Um, workers' comp, as many people know, can provide medical treatment for life, permanency awards, lost wages. Um, these can all be incredibly expensive propositions um, if COVID is found to be a work-related occupational disease. Um, the nature of COVID is such also that it can lead to long-term and sometimes catastrophic effects, as we heard earlier this evening. And it's important to understand that just because a presumption might be, might be put into effect here, um, that the other side will do everything they can to probe into your personal lives even, get as much information as they can to maybe use things against you. So um, for example, um, the, the secretary that I mentioned um, earlier that might have carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, let's say that secretary um, has a side business where he or she knits 20, 30 hours a week using, using her hands or his hands. Or this person um, is a chef part-time and spends 20 hours a week chopping vegetables, again, using their hands. Um, you know, those kinds of things are relevant. It's the same thing with COVID. And if the burden is placed on the employer to disprove assertions, then they are going to uh, tap into whatever they can. And that involves finding out um, possibly what you do in your personal life, whether you're someone who uh, stays in more, someone who has maybe pushed the envelope, gone out to bars and restaurants, whether you're someone who lives alone, whether you're someone who shares a house with five or 10 people, how often those people go out, you know, what kind of social distancing you observe. They will look for anything to get themselves out of paying for what they should be paying for. And a lot of these questions are going to be fair game, um, including past medical records, because one of the things about COVID is that it's still being learned about by the medical community, and it's still trying to be understood what the long-term effects on people's bodies are. So it's entirely possible you could have a situation down the road where, uh, as a result of blood clots, you develop a stroke, um, where as a result of organ damage, you develop other ailments. And again, the way that they're going to try to defend against this may be to get your personal medical records and see what kind of history you have. So be prepared with this shifting burden to also be, uh, be able to defend against what the other side is knowingly going to do, which is to aggressively try to um, rebut these presumptions. So I've preached this all along. I will continue to preach this this evening. Documentation is the key to everything. Documentation is the key to being successful in bringing these cases. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about if you have a potential exposure at work, make a note of it. If you test positive for COVID or start developing symptoms related to COVID, do a log of where you were the 14 days prior, who you came in contact with, where you went, what you did. All of these things may become relevant to the case and they will be impossible to actively, uh, I'm sorry, accurately recreate those six months later or a year later if you're before um, a judge or a jury. Equally and vitally as important is that even with a presumption, if a case is challenged legally, you still need to have certain things in line to prove what it is that you're that you're asserting. And one of those things is medical documentation and medical causal relation opinions. You still need those things because the other side is going to have you see a doctor 
who I guarantee you is going to write a report which is not supportive of your case. You're going to need to rebut their rebuttal. And the way that you do that is when you see your doctor, you be explicit in terms of what your symptoms are, the history of when they started, and what you're experiencing. Because again, you don't know if this is going to turn into a flu, uh, flu-like symptoms you know, in your lungs. You don't know if this is going to turn into a, a stroke later on. Um, again, they, they're still finding things out about this in the medical community. And um, documentation is, is, is everything, as well as getting causal relation opinions. And to that end, which doctor you see is, is a very big deal. Um, primary care physicians are great. Um, but for the more serious cases, I've been referring people out to specialists, infectious disease specialists, people that in the medical community are most up to date with the research, most up to date with the developments, um, people that think outside the box sometimes and know what to look for. And unfortunately, if they find something that they're looking for, know how to write a report such that it will stand up to scrutiny and stand up to um, the, the necessities of, of a legal court case. So um, choice of doctor is, is hugely important. Um, what you tell the doctor is usually important. A log of where you were personally before you contracted the virus is equally as important. And these are the kinds of things that I want to make clear um, people need to be cognizant of regardless of the passage of this bill, because I can guarantee you that um, the other side will never fully concede these things, these things which can cost these insurance companies a great deal of money. Uh, they will not be conceded. They will be challenged. And yes, the law is helpful, um, but I wanna make it clear, it's not the be all end all. The presumption is invaluable, but it is not the final determination in a claim. Okay, so um, I will leave it there um, and be happy to stick around for any, any questions. Um, there are a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but there are a number of presumptive um, bills which have been in existence for quite some time. Um, and it's important to look at how those have been treated by the courts and how they've been defended by insurance companies. And, and that will give us insight, it does give us insight into what to expect. And we can all expect that, again, they will fight these things, but with the support of uh, everyone involved, um, the politicians, the delegates, the labor unions, the attorneys, the doctors, with, with everyone's help and everyone working as a team, hopefully we can change this landscape and really, really get the protections that the law should be providing people that so far um, have been sorely lacking um, in this situation. So um, with that, uh, again, thank you for having me and I look forward to answering further questions. I wanna thank, um, my name is Todd Reynolds. I'm the uh, political coordinator for the AFT Maryland. I do wanna thank uh, Mr. Udoff, um, is a very good, um, labor advocate for working people in the state. Um, and I also do want to thank um, also uh, 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 Delegate Valderrama um, and uh, 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 Ms. Ms. Reed as well before we move into the Q&A session. Um, I did want to um, uh, 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 bring our attention to a few things about, you know, one of the things that Delegate um, Valderrama um, uh, uh, brought up is that we need to figure out how we're gonna uh, how we're gonna support this bill as working people. It's so important for us to take action if we want to save lives and make it so people who catch COVID at work receive justice and the compensation they deserve. Uh, we're still learning uh, of the long term effects of COVID nineteen, and certainly anyone who can't work because of the effects of COVID must must be granted workers' compensation if they're able to pay the bills, put groceries on the table for themselves and their families, and make sure they still have a roof over their heads. 
Um, legislators, uh, Val, Delegate Valderrama is fantastic. Um, uh, many legislators don't automatically know our stories and our worries. Unfortunately, muddied interests, and, and Mr. Yudoff mentioned a number of them, not just bosses and management, but also insurance companies especially, uh, don't want to pay out workers' compensation claims, have made killing our bill their top national priority. This is getting a lot of national press from insurance companies uh, that they want to kill this bill. Uh, unless legislators can hear from us, our bill is not going to make it, and it'll be harder for workers to claim uh, workers' comp for COVID, for catching COVID on the job. Um, sometime either tonight or tomorrow, um, all attendees, all of you who, uh, who are here today, um, are going to receive a, a, an email from us inviting you to tell your stories. Um, it doesn't have to be grandiose. We do know that everyone has fears about what it means for them if they unfortunately catch COVID at work. When you do get those emails, please take the time to fill them out. Some of you uh, uh, want to tell your stories directly before the legislature may be able to do so. This form that we're gonna be sending to you is the first step in this process. We'll help you uh, shape and edit your story so that you may be able to effectively ask your representatives to pass workers' comp protections for us in the time of COVID. Again, all attendees will get a follow-up uh, email from us very soon. Please fill it out so that we may begin the process of moving this bill and letting our electeds know how important it is to pass HB 1199. We know that everybody's been work all day and we don't wanna hold them much longer. However, I wanna thank everyone for coming to this webinar. This legislation like others in Annapolis is vital to our work and lives. And it is great that we learn as much as possible as we can and know our rights. We know that we have to be in Annapolis to get this uh, legislation passed. I wanna thank Mr. Udall for all your information. Thank you for staying with us. Thank the delegates and Ms. Reed for sharing that information. If you have any questions moving forward, reach out to your local union for more information. I'd like to thank the entire AFT Maryland team for putting this together. And, um, and on behalf of everyone at AFT Maryland, solidarity to all. Good night, have a good evening, stay safe, wear a mask, don't touch your face and be safe. Thank you.